Hey everyone, thanks for joining this panel discussion, demystifying zero trust for cloud native applications. So before we go into topics, what we are going to discuss, I would like to introduce my panel here who is sitting. And then first, I'll let all this stuff, before we go to the panel, I just want to highlight that all the topics presented in this discussion related to uh, it, individual views not associated to any organization. Let me introduce myself. This is, I'm Kishore Nadendla, uh, senior, leading, senior, senior leading leading manager and TA cloud security team and working on multiple cloud technologies and solutions. Mm -hmm. So as you see here, and I'm a great a good advocate on the inner source and open source projects and recently practicing in you know, inclusive speaking. So. And uh, I, in my past, I worked on a lot of cloud, multi-cloud, digital transformation projects. And in, with that said, I'm going to in, uh, introduce and pass on to Aradhana. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you for joining uh, today. Um, I head cloud security for TIAA, um, including DevSecOps and application security. I am co-chair for CNCF Tag Security, CSA Research Fellow, and I'm also co-chair for Civilist Working Group. I have contributed to a number of NIST initiatives, um, and I'm an inventor. Thank you. Hey, my name is Marius Sabath, and I'm the senior software engineer in IBM Research. My interests are around building scalable distributed environments. I specialize in addressing challenges for workload identity in multi-cloud and hybrid cloud scenarios. I have done several patents in this space, and I'm an active contributor to the open source. I'm also a member of the Zero Trust Working Group under CNCF Security Tag. Thank you. Hi everyone, Philip Griffiths from NetFoundry. Uh, I do technical advocacy uh, for the company. So talking to people with pains, communities, open source forums, uh, events, and lots of uh, writing blogs and content. Um, that covers work that I do within the CNCF in the Zero Trust Working Group. I also do some stuff with uh, the Cloud Security Alliance and some other security-based places. I'm generally a, uh, uh, a technical generalist, so I know lots of things about lots of different topics. At the moment, very focused on zero trust, distributed systems, um, and automating uh, the systems that we use. Hi, uh, my name is Asad Fazi. I'm a Seattle-based ent uh, entrepreneur and technologist. Over 20 years experience at senior level technical positions in large enterprises, including Microsoft, PayPal, Intel, and Netscape. Uh, I've founded multiple startups. I've published more than 50 articles, blogs, tutorials on cloud native technologies. And I'm also a member of Security Tag, the supply chain and Security Tag Zero Trust Working Groups of CNCF. Thank you. Thanks everyone. So before I hand it over a couple of uh, questions to panelist here, I just want to say the Zero Trust has been there for years in the different forms, but you know, the failure of traditional security models not working as a as, you know, lot of workloads are moved to cloud native. With that said, you know, uh, some of the hybrid, hybrid IT contest is in place, and now I want to pass it on to Aradhana and say, uh, ask a question that what is what is uh, you mean by zero trust and wh why do you think everyone has to focus? Thank you, Kishore, for that question. So as you all know, zero trust is a term used for evolving set of cybersecurity paradigms, which kind of break the traditional model of network-based security, right, at the perimeter. Enterprise perimeters are vanishing um, and uh, because, um, Enterprises are going to BYOD, remote access, cloud, cloud native technologies. So you are in a distributed world of connected software. So the main philosophy behind zero trust is to not implicitly grant any trust and based on that trust grant access. So every access is granted on a dynamic basis um, and um, based on the attributes of the user application and device. Um, and based on the context, the decision to allow access or deny access is made. 
again, this, as you said, it's not a new concept. It's just that in the new paradigm, the threat landscape growing so much, the traditional security methods are not valid. And zero trust literally touches every part of the enterprise IT, like network and environment, applications, users, data, devices, automation and orchestration, as well as visibility and analytics. When it comes to the cloud native technologies, there are descriptive languages. You can use Helm charts, Terraform, as well as you know, custom resource definitions to predefine the desired state of infrastructure and applications that you want in, an infra in your environment. And that allows you to define what type of access and what application behavior is, is desired or accepted. Um, so that is a, a key enabler for zero trust in cloud native platforms. So with that, um, I think I'll hand it back over to you. Thanks, Arana. That was a great perspective about cloud native. So Mario's question to you, what does zero trust mean to any organization? What are the principles someone really need to look into that? Okay, thank you, Kishore, for this. Uh, Zero Trust, like Radna said, it's not a specific product or a single tool. It's more like a strategy. So let me give you an example. With COVID, we experienced a shift to a remote work. And now companies and organizations could no longer rely on the perimeter control, meaning the implicit access based on location to the building or to the office, whether physical on, or network, is not sufficient anymore. So this is when the zero trust principles really took off. And this leads to your second question, what are the principles of the zero trust? So first, always verify, never trust, eliminate implicit trust, assume a breach, plan for compromised systems and compromised elements, a principle of least privilege that we'll talk about this in a second authenticate and authorize each operation before the connection can be established. Use the strong identity like X509 certificates. So in one sentence, right user has access to right data for the right reasons at the right time. So back to you, Kishore. What does yeah. this all mean for the cloud native world? When we say cloud native or before cloud native, traditional people are used to be traditional VMs and they were, when they are migrating uh, the VMs to from the legacy servers to VM and the firewalls are pretty easy and now they followed what they, uh, what was their what was implemented in legacy servers. But when we say cloud native, most of the workloads are moving to microservices, containers, et cetera. So microservices are, uh, and containers are short lived and then you need to, you need to deal with the, the security uh, altogether differently. So when we have these short layered containers, we need to have these policies and uh, the, the firewalls are no giving access to these workloads needs to be created separately. So that's where we, we need to have a strict verification what this pod or container can really talk to other workloads uh, within the network, outside the network, et cetera. Not only that, you know, when we deploying these workloads into the cloud or multi-cloud and hybrid cloud environment, we need to make sure our continuous delivery pipeline goes also having implementing necessary security controls. And last but not least, when we are deploying the pods, there is no IPs. IPs are constants changing, so you cannot define the firewalls on top of IPs. So you need to have the policies, which is beyond, uh, which, these policies need to go with the labels and uh, all the uh, DNS, et cetera. So don't use it rather, rather than using IP addresses. So the security professionals need to change their perspective instead of using IP addresses, uh, change their, their implementation solutions to implementation solution to no cloud native security procedures. No, that's all I can say about cloud native approach. So with that said, I, I would like to pass on to Philip to talk about what are the building blocks, we, since we already talked about zero trust and cloud native and all those stuff. What do you think is you know, some of the building blocks somebody needs to consider? Yeah, it's a good question. Thanks, Kishore. For me, it very much maps to 
um, the the definitions of the pillars within zero trust. So I think one of the, one of the the foundational ones is is, is identity. How do we uh, provide X509 certificates and use JWTs so that, as you say, instead of trusting IP addresses, we can have we can have strong identity as as, as a route for whether we trust something or not a component of the 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 platform. And that that that's both the platform or that's that's the platform. It's also workloads. It's also users because we're seeing our platforms being distributed beyond just you know multi-cloud but also into edge iot and and you know users accessing those applications as well we then have to consider whatever workload within this system of this platform that's part of the operations what's connecting in how do we make sure that workload is protected you know with your uh, protecting against next generation threats viruses malware you know etc then we need to consider how the applications are developed how we make sure the software development pipeline uh, ensures that we're not bringing in vulnerabilities, how we make sure we can we can potentially run those applications in a secure enclave in production so that we're giving uh, the runtime less trust and how we can how we can automate uh, that full process from 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 left development to, to right production. You've then got the network um, between this. So uh, as you said, again, we don't want to trust IP addresses because they're dynamic. They're not. They're not static. They they change around. It's 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 distributed. So we need to build an overlay network or a service mesh that enables us to to ensure strong identity, micro segmentation, least privilege, authentication, authorization before connection. All those those wonderful principles. And then we need to ensure that we have visibility and monitoring of the solution so that we can control policy governance. And then I think as well, there's 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 almost the overarching bit of, of how do all these things integrate? They cannot be single point solutions. There needs to be a way in which you tie them all together so that you have, for example, if, if uh, you know, if you don't have that strong identity, you can't get onto to the overlay network. Or if your, your endpoint or host has been compromised, it's removed and revoked access. And it's by bringing these blocks together and then building that whole sum that we're able to, to build zero trust principles into our cloud native platforms. Thanks, Philip. I, th uh, I think uh, talking about micro segmentation and controlling the policies and it's a great thing to have. Asad, do you think any other building blocks somebody needs to consider on their cloud native journey by implementing zero trust? Uh, yeah, sure. Thanks. Thanks, Kishore. I, I tend to speak uh, uh, very quickly, so fast. So I'll try to slow down today so that you can understand, uh, everybody can understand. Philip has done a great job laying down the foundation, but I want to talk about three key building blocks of zero trust and cloud native application. One is the access based control, two is the data encryption and least privilege access, and three, continuous monitoring. Access-based control is the key aspect of zero trust and cloud native application. It is a security model in which access to resources is granted only on need to know basis and all access is verified and continuously monitored. This is in contrast with the traditional security model which rely on perimeter based security and trust all devices and users within the perimeter. In a cloud native environment, access-based control can be implemented using identity and access management IAM solutions. These solutions are used to manage and verify the identities of users and devices accessing the network. This includes user authentication and authorization, as well as uh, multi-factor authentication, MFA, and single sign-on SSL capabilities. Overall, access-based control is a crucial aspect of trust, zero trust in cloud native application as it helps to ensure that only authorized users and devices have access to the sensitive resources. By implementing access-based control, organizations can reduce the risk of security incidents and make it more difficult for attackers to compromise the system. Access-based control can also be used to enforce least privileged access in cloud native application, which limits access to the minimum necessary to perform a task and revoke access as soon as it is no longer needed. Access to data is granted only on a need to know basis and all access is verified and continuously monitored. This includes granting access to specific resources such as data or application 
or limiting access to specific actions such as read or write access. Then there is data encryption, both in transit and at rest to protect it from unauthorized access. This can include using encryption for data sto uh, in, uh, stored in the cloud, as well as encryption for data stored in the device or in transit across the network. Continuous monitoring is an essential component of zero trust implementation in cloud native application. It is the process of continuously monitoring the network for suspicious activities and taking action to prevent and respond to security threats. Overall, access-based control is a crucial aspect of zero trust in cloud native application. By implementing access-based con uh, controls, organization can reduce the risk of security incidents and make it more difficult for attackers to compromise the system. Back to you, Kishore. Thank you. Thank you for a detailed uh, explanation about all those million blocks, Philip and Asal. Aradna, back to you. You heard about uh, the cloud native and the building blocks. You know, our team is talking about it. So with all this said, what are the challenges somebody needs to think about it to implement Zero Trust? Interesting question. Um, lots of challenges, in my opinion. So IP addresses have been central to the traditional network security. When you go to cloud, they're not visible. They're ephemeral. They're constantly changing. And you add Kubernetes to that, where you have dynamic ephemeral resources, which are spinning up and spinning down very quickly. Um, securing all of this at the pace at which it happens is quite challenging. That's the first thing. And Kubernetes itself is, you know, wide open. You are required to figure out how to secure your Kubernetes platform, the control plane, the data plane, and the APIs, and uh, all the interfaces. And then you are required to, literally, you should have another um, overlay on top of it to further improve your micro segmentation, even though Kubernetes provides network security policies that you can deploy. And how Kubernetes works, I mean, cloud native, um, we have serverless and we have other technologies as, as part of it too, but the heart of the problem is still Kubernetes, right? Kubernetes is the underlying technology. In Kubernetes, um, the designers are expected um, to figure out all the controls. Um, for this and then in the CICD pipeline, pre-deployment, all the checks you have to do, right? Um, software supply chain security, making sure all the third-party libraries are integrated properly and all the policies, infrastructure as code, policies that you're deploying, the Istio manifest and the YAML uh, validation that you need to do. And then in runtime, you need controls as well, right? Um, so it is it creates a very dynamic environment and lots of components to manage. And Kubernetes essentially, it doesn't it, it doesn't take the context of an enterprise network, right? There are no IP addresses, there's no fixed boundaries. These are ephemeral dynamic services. And basically the security, the way it works is it just keeps track of who's doing what and when, right? And when you have thousands of these services dynamically spinning up, that creates a whole different paradigm of security that you need to address. Um, and all these policies and keeping track of these policies constantly and updating them dynamically to keep your environment secure brings a whole different dimension of security to a cloud native platform. And the technology is still evolving, right? Every day we have new threats and we need to figure out how to mitigate those. And um, like Asad said, there's continuous monitoring. Monitoring we have in all systems, but in cloud native, you have to use that monitoring and intelligence to feed back into your policies. So you're continually raising the bar in terms of security of your platform. So all these complexities bring great challenges for the enterprises to secure them. Thanks, Arana. Dynamic environment, constantly changing technologies. Thanks for all those pointing. So, Marius, back to you. With all the challenges Aradhana mentioned and what are the topics we talked about, do you ever see is there a golden path to implement the zero trust? A golden path to zero trust. Okay. Well, let's start with identity. Yeah. Uh, users they have to be authenticated and authorized to be able to do anything in a cloud. And there is nothing new. Even across multi-clouds, we already have concepts like single sign-on, and that's problem already solved. The interesting challenge, however, is the workload identity. Microservices or containers that represent the service need to communicate with each other. They access APIs, they pull data, make calls, etc. 
And with the zero trust, each transaction must be explicitly authorized. So every cloud handles identity in fairly similar way. It comes with IAM, Identity and Access Management, that is integrated with the platform. This identity provider consists of certificate authority or root of trust yeah. to provision identities for workloads. When the container wants to access a service or database, it takes that identity in form of the X509 certificate and presents it to policy enforcement point, which verifies this identity with identity service. And then based on the policies, it either grants or rejects the access. So when the organization uses multiple different cloud providers, things become even more interesting. The containers need, need to be able to securely communicate not only with each other, but also between different clouds. So how do we do it? We cannot use static key because the key generated, like API key, is long-lived and we lose control of it when the system is compromised. Uh, we don't know how many copies of the key were created, who actually has access to the key, and to move the API key between clouds, it often requires a human to perform this action. So we put a lot of trust in a person that must, that must be certified to handle certain data for compliance reasons. So we could potentially use federation. The idea is that we teach IAM system of one cloud how to interpret identities of another cloud that is calling the service. But support for worker identity federation across clouds varies. Worker identities are defined differently by different cloud providers. They don't necessarily translate well across clouds. And since the schemas are different, it makes it very difficult to establish a trust relationship or to make meaningful access policies. And finally, since federation has to be done between each cloud, as the organization scales up, the configuration management becomes a nightmare. It's a quadratic complexity. So to solve this, we can use something like Spire that manages worker identities between clouds in a universal way since, cloud, since it's cloud provider agnostic. And there is no more hard-coded static keys. Then we can support common identity schemas that are not tied to any specific cloud, and that simplifies this access policies. All these examples, all the solutions are based on CNCF projects, and we covered this in details in our white paper. So please check our work. Yeah. There is, however, another challenge. The workload identity is tied to Kubernetes, to the platform, or to the cloud provider. So can we really trust the host? Do we know what's running there? Underlying software stack might be tampered with. What about the on-prem or edge deployments? Can we trust those? Well, we do attestation. We can attest the node that is hosting the workload to guarantee its identity beyond any doubt. Attest the software stack all the way from booting all the way to kernel. Enforce the software bill of materials. We can measure and enforce the integrity of the files. And we could revoke when the attestation fails. All these attestation aspects, including the hardware root of trust, uh, cover well in our paper. So I hope this helps. So now, Philip, can you tell us about network, infrastructure, applications? Yeah, network aspect, definitely. I think the... You know, the, the the starting point is how how we how we implement our, our zero trust networking principles to cover communication with the objective that we can ensure safe, fast, and reliable communication and virtualization of the work network to whatever resources are in our system, whether it's a client to server for for example, someone accessing the Kubernetes API or or server to server with clusters communicating or or machine to server as we move into IoT and edge use cases. And, and picking up from where you started, the, the, what's really fundamental is that you start with identity, such as an X509 certificate, so that you're doing authorization and your initial point of trust based upon that rather than uh, IP addresses. And once 
we are ensuring that all communication is taking place on the basis of mutually authenticated identities to establish connections, we can also start looking at how we can implement authentication authorization before connectivity. That's almost the opposite of how most networks operate. You send a packet and it goes, well, should, should I let it in? No, you like you should be authenticating that the thing has access to the data plane before it's able to get access to the data plane. So we're really following a, a software defined network in architecture where we're, we're splitting those two things, the, the control plane and the data plane. We're then further able to implement application micro segmentation where we can do attribute based access control and least privilege you know, to, to specific IP addresses or specific identities or, or specific uh, DNS and uh, other uh, aspects of how our applications want to communicate and you know, potentially even down to a, a specific service, which can have a, a you know, zero trust networking built into that application. And this enables us to get to a point where we can create a network which is closed by default rather than open by default as traditional networks were built. And this should all be built in a way that is driven by software and APIs so that we're ensuring that we can have the agility uh, of distributed systems and to be able to move as fast as the software developers and, and platform wants to move in itself in a way that um, is highly automated. Once we start being able to achieve that, then we start being able to eliminate traditional networking approaches like, you know, access control lists and, you know, whitelisting inbound uh, IPs on your firewall uh, and VPNs and, you know, other such things so that we, we make it much simpler. And there is various aspects which are covered in our white paper, which would be great to have people looking at. And, and it really, you know, there's different technologies which can do this, whether you're talking about service meshes, whether you're talking about zero trust overlay networks, um, some API gateways have the ability to implement parts of this as well. And it really becomes a question of how do I want to implement? What are the pros and cons I'm looking for? And a quick comment. I feel um, we should highlight that. Um, just having micro segmentation uh, based on STO service mesh and, you know, all traffic encrypted between um, applications and services, it also prevents reduces our attack surface greatly. If one application gets compromised, rest of your real estate of applications and microservices is still secure. And that's the advantage that Istio provides. And Istio has evolved quite a bit over the last few years. And now they are, they are even, you can even enforce application security policies in Istio, right? Um, and so on and so forth. So just wanted to highlight that. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Aridhan. No, totally. I, I understand that. Uh, so Marius and Philip has covered quite a bit and, and in great details and done a wonderful job of covering the aspects of Golden Path. Like, for example, Marius covered identity um, and um, attestation. Philip has covered network and environment, micro segmentation. Uh, it's a tough act to follow, but uh, I believe there is no one golden path to implement zero trust for cloud native application for uh, for every organization. But there are some general guidelines that organizations can follow. Yeah. At the heart of zero trust is the principle of least privileged access. It is implemented in cloud native application by controlling and managing access to the resources. This ensures that only authorized users have access to the sensitive data and that access is limited to the minimum necessary to perform a task. This can be achieved through a combination of different security controls, in, uh, including number one, while IAM is used to manage and, uh, and control access to resources at the level of individual users and devices, RBAC, on the other hand, is a system that is used to control access to resources at the level of roles and permissions. It is used to define roles that specify the actions that users or group of users are allowed to perform on specific resources. RBAC, for example, is used to control access to resources in a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, Philip has already covered micro segmentation, so I'm going to skip that. Um, I talked about data encryption earlier, both in transit and at rest, including in the cloud on devices and in, uh, and in transit. In cloud native application it is important since it ensures that even if the data is compromised, it will be unreadable without the encryption keys. 
um, strong encryption algorithms like AES and RSA can be used for data encryption. Encryption keys can be managed and protected to ensure that they are not compromised and can only be accessed by authorized personnel. Cloud native environment is dynamic and it is essential to have real-time visibility and monitoring to enforce the zero trust access-based control. In a cloud native environment, continuous monitoring can be achieved through the use of security information and event management, SIEM systems, security orchestration, automation and response, SOAR platforms, and other security monitoring tools. These tools can be used to collect, analyze, and correlate security-related data from various sources. In cloud native application, access logs and auditing are used to track and monitor access to data and resources. This allows organizations to identify, investigate any suspicious access attempts and quickly respond to any security incidents. By implementing these security controls, organization can ensure that only authorized users and devices have access to sensitive data and that access is limited to minimum necessary to perform a, a task. Back to you, Kishore. Thanks, Asar. Uh, thank you, everyone. And the, the golden path approach with all the building blocks you guys provided is a great value for the teams who are listening here. So now, Aradna, you heard about golden path, build, uh, building blocks, and then summary of cloud native technologies. So how somebody is working on a cloud native applications or the organization can take this one further? What are the first thing they have to do? You want to summarize this? Um, yeah, in short, I think um, everybody has to go to Zero Trust eventually because um, now it's a mandate from President's Cybersecurity Executive Order, especially if you're doing business with the government. Um, and the threat landscape has evolved so much. Every, every organization is targeting or at least is working towards um, Zero Trust especially with all the ransomware attacks and those threats as well, uh, they have increased quite a bit. Um, and if the organizations are in the cloud native platforms already, then they have golden paths, right? They know what to secure. And, and the more you can do on the pre-deployment side, enforce identities, validate your software supply chain security, enforce policies for what can be deployed and what is your desired state and what application can access, what services or what data or what users or devices um, can access what applications and services. I think that desired state as the more we can, uh, enterprises can identify and define upfront, the easier it becomes. But again, this is an evolution. This uh, zero trust is not the first day, you know, there's no easy button that uh, overnight you are uh, zero trust. Um, these policies will grow, evolve over time. Uh, but you start somewhere, right? Even to grow and evolve, you need to start taking some baseline um, controls and policies, deploy them in your pipeline and in your runtime environment, start gathering intelligence. And as you get more and more feedback, you enhance those policies. You know, having strong identity and uh, authentication uh, infrastructure is important. You need to have, uh, you know, um, like um, Maria said, federation and um, you know, open ID connect and uh, SPF IDs to be able to enforce and or identify applications in the runtime, right? Uh, and the whole image programs uh, validation in the runtime of what images are in your repository and what are the running in the runtime, as well as how you are securing your repos, what gets into your repos, who has access to what in your repos. Yeah. I think these are some basic hygiene best practices in a cloud native platform that will help you to get towards zero trust. But the more you can define the desired state upfront, who accesses what and how they are segmented and what policies need to be deployed for what, what workloads, I think easier it gets for the enterprises to be able to achieve zero trust over time. Thanks, Arana. I think, you know, start small and improve on top of it. That's a great advice. So with that said, I'm going to share my screen back. So that concludes our uh, panel discussion here. And uh, who are listening? I know we, here is a team, I know the five panelists here working on a cloud native uh, tag security team. We are working on zero trust uh, white paper. And we have white paper links over here and we have weekly meeting and uh, every Friday we meet. 
So we welcome you to join us and participate in writing in this white paper or suggesting us and correcting us or whatever the help you guys can provide. It's a great help. And thank you so much for joining.